Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. This is a, such an important topic that we're, we're going to be discussing today because it impacts so many of us, in, especially this year in 2020, where we've had conversations around diversity, implicit bias. It's not just in the legal field. It's, it's, it's a conversation our whole country is having. But we are going to drill down into the legal market, ADR, but first, Michael, Clyde, Robbie, I want to know, it means everything, it means different things to everyone. What does diversity mean to you and why is it important both professionally and personally? I guess I will go in the same order. I, I'll give a start. I mean, I think, at least for me, I think diversity matters for um, both for both for perception. Um, you know, I, I have a number of clients who, um, if we're talking about it in the ADR context, um, a, a lot of my clients happen to be Latino, Hispanic uh, clients who speak Spanish, are coming to a situation where they. Um, frankly, a lot of times feel like there are a lot of um, older white lawyers maybe haggling over their futures or what's going on with them, and they don't feel represented in the process. And that perception for them is important. So that, that's certainly one part of it and a big part of it, and, and maybe a, a part of it that's um, getting a little bit more, more focused now. Um, I think the other part of it is... Um, is an actual perspective, um, you know, and, that, and that's something that I think we um, we take for granted that most people think like us or that most of us are um, good people. And we think, and, and, and so therefore, no matter what our background is, we can think with that perspective. Um, and that's not true. And, and, and it's not true if you don't have those conversations with people who come from a different perspective than you do. Um, whether that be race, gender, sexual identity, sexual orientation, um, whatever the case might be, those perspectives are important and are important in the law. I think both is how we set policy, but also is how we represent our clients through all stages of litigation. Um, so that's diversity to me. Great. Well, and I'll piggyback on, on Michael's um, uh, remarks regarding perspective. Well, let me take a quick pivot if I can. Um, when I think about diversity, I also think about um, inclusion and equity. One of the things that, that um, as I sit here, it just stands out to me, I have often been the only, the only in my practice, the only at my firm, the only in my class, the only in a certain, you know, um, and when you're the only, there is often a tendency to not Feel as if you can fully express or show who you are. And in your perspective, going back to something that Michael um, was, was breaking up a second ago, you will often tamper that down because you don't want to seem so different because you are the only. One of the things that I've realized uh, with regards to diversity and inclusion, um, for me, it allows me and folk that I know who are in the space to kind of go, ah, right? Mm -hmm. I can breathe a little bit. I can work and not have to think about all this other craziness if I, if, if, if I can um, uh, be truly embraced for all of who I am, uh, my difference in thought, my difference in perspective, and you respect and appreciate the fact that I have different life experiences. Everybody didn't go to UGA to me offend anybody UGA people. Everyone is not a, 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 a cisgender white, you know, male, um, uh, uh, so that's what they, and with regards to inclusion, because um, I think they're hand in hand, um, I need to understand that all of who I am, I am valued, I can bring and participate 100% with who I am and not try to dumb down using this here, not try to adjust who I am and to have a different frame of, 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 of speaking. All right, um, start talking about the ballet when I don't like the ballet, which I am a patron of ballet, though. I'm just using these phrases, right? Um, I, I can really be who I am, and you respect that and, and include me and in all of who I am in the space. Robbie, what are your thoughts? And I, I, I think I'd piggyback on uh, what 
Clyde and Michael have said, it's, I mean, what diversity to me is about a, a range of, expe- of, of perspective, a range of experiences, um, a, a recognition that not all of us are exactly alike in all, of, all sorts of ways. Um, I mean, I think from my perspective, one of the things that's important is recognizing when we're, you know, what's, what's the name of the old book? Why do all the black kids sit at, uh, eat lunch together? Um, I mean, that, and I, I, this is what one of the things I said on our earlier call was one of the parts about being white in America is not thinking about being white very often. Um, and it is a, and so diversity, I, I think the piece that I need to be reflective about and intentional about and would encourage other folks to be is diversity does not just mean black people and other people of color. Uh, there are circumstances in which bringing white people in is creates diversity. Um, their diversity in one of the reasons, and I apologize for the tangent, but one of the reasons why I was, I think I benefited from going to Woodward in the eighties and nineties is that at the time Woodward was a more diverse private school than other Atlanta private schools were. And it was more diverse in, in ways that go beyond race, ethnicity. It was diverse. And, and that's leads me back to my point, which is diversity is not just about, not always only about race, ethnicity, religion, those things, but it's also about experience. I mean, some of my best friends in, in, at Woodward were kids who grew up in Peachtree City, kids who grew up outside of downtown Atlanta. I grew up in Midtown. I had a very specific set of experiences that was very different for somebody who grew up on the shore of Lake Spivey uh, or in College Park, for instance. Um, And the opportunity to meet people who were different than me in any host of different ways um, was part of the diversity of that experience, recognizing though that the idea of going to a private school and cherishing it for its diversity is itself, there's a blind spot there too. Yeah. Uh, You know, but I'm good. I, I guess I share that, that, that similar blind spot because I, I went to an all girls private school from kindergarten through 12th grade, but of the 54 or 53 other young women that I graduated with, um, I was able, you know, I knew when Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were coming up. We talked about Diwali. Uh, we, we understood that we had a range of, of perspectives and experiences there that I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. If I had gone to my local public school, I, I wouldn't have shared. Um, and, and so in being d- in different environments, I recognized that, oh my goodness, not everyone had any clue about uh, even a range of religions. Uh, And I also recognized going to that school uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and being the child of a Southern mother, that not everybody ate grits either. But... (laughs) that's a completely separate thing. And, yeah. uh, but you know, diversity again, uh, yeah. but Michael, I wanted to pick up on something that you said, because I think it's so important and especially in this moment for us as a country and as a community, you said that good people can differ in their opinions and their views. And, and that in and of itself helps us, right? Like if we are hearing that good people have different things to say, we, we're so polarized in so many different ways and we can objectify someone who may not share our same view. And I think that that tends to break down relationships on all different levels. And, and certainly you and I as neutrals understand that part of what we do is getting people to see okay, there are different ways to interpret a situation depending on where you are. And I tell people a lot, I want to put you in the other side's shoes. Not so you can agree, 
but just so you can understand it. Mm-hmm. And how do you think that, and I'm, I'll pose this to all of you, how do, how do you think that thinking intentionally about diversity, inclusion, equity, lends to that? Well, let me, and, and I was, I was going to use that word exactly, and, and Robbie touched on that word of intentionality. Um, you know, a lot of um, my specific views on, on what we're talking about now um, are informed, I mean, from my own personal experiences, but, um, but the ABA did a, um, I think, did a study or did uh, on, on implicit bias um, yes, in 2016, right? And, and, and what's fascinating to that, to, to me about that and, and about the way we approach diversity, implicit bias is understanding our subconscious thought and, and basically, basically what the neuroscience shows, what the, the way we think is essentially like an iceberg, right? You, the, our conscious thought is that little bit that's showing above the water and our subconscious thought and, and what we do is that is that majority that's beneath the water. And I think the, the important thing about that, because everyone, everyone wants to feel like I'm a good person and it is, um, it is challenging and it can be terrifying to people if you challenge that assumption about them. They feel attacked. But I think there's an intentional way that all of us think about the way that we address whatever the issue might be, right? If, if, if I'm coming at it from a perspective of, you know, I am a white Latino who grew up in Cobb County, Georgia. I have a different perspective than, you know, first generation law student who, you know, family came here from, from Mexico at some point, right? I have that, we have a different perspective and I need to be aware and willing to listen and accept them for who they are, to, to Clyde's point, all of who they are, um, and, and listen to who they are and where they're coming from and not think, not give my knee jerk reaction to certain things that might be said because we all do have different perspectives and it's it's to our benefit to listen and hear those differences and to understand our own to think about our own biases towards the things that we might see or hear or might make us uncomfortable and be willing to challenge them and so your word of intentionality i think is the perfect word because i think whether you are an organization um, an individual what, whatever the case might be, um, there is a challenge there to be intentional about your own implicit biases and how, and, and frankly, the perspectives that you probably need to hear more of to understand where other people are coming from. It's funny, man. One of the things that um, I've had to reassure, and I, and I appreciate the honesty with this, with this conversation. I'm anticipating it's going to continue that same way. But one of the things I've had to reassure certain uh, colleagues or um, individuals with whom I speak at different institutions, when folk talk about diversity, I love your words, intentionality. There's some people who, they, you, you know how it, how it is. They roll their eyes like, here we go again. Or, oh, what do I have to do now? How much work do I have to put in, right? And I and I come on back, Robbie. I try to tell all my my straight white male uh, colleagues over the years. When we talk about diversity. It's not saying we attack every straight white male, right? No, um, it, it's 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 the being intentional um, with regards to the things that you know and the things that you try to learn, things that you don't know. We had a a um, speaker at the office at one of our retreats we did a few years ago, and she talked about. Um, um, implicit bias. And I think Bianca, we were on a panel a couple years ago with, we you know, with State Bar talking about implicit bias. So I had to dig into that a little bit more because I didn't, I'm a nerd, sorry. This kind of stuff intrigued me. And I loved your, your analogy of the iceberg because when you think about implicit bias, it's, it's my experiences. If I had experience with a, with a young female associate who got pregnant and she left me on, on a project one time, I'm less inclined to, to hire another young female associate. I think they're all great, but you know, I just don't, right? Or I don't understand quite how when that guy brings that food in for work, it just triggers certain things for me. It just, I don't understand, right? So, so the whole implicit bias thing, being intentional about um, um, knowing what you, I'm sorry, learning what you don't know, right? And kind of addressing what you do. Um, what, for me, uh, it's always been, I've never had the, the privilege of not, of, of not thinking about being black. It's, it's just never, I've never had that privilege. Even though 
my life now is way different than the life I grew up with. You know, you know, we have that, you know, 2.5 kids in a upper middle class neighborhood with the dog, with the band around her collar with dots on it and running around a big yard. <laughs> right. But at the same time, if I were to leave my house, we had a, a slew of car break ins in my neighborhood, which turned out to be some kids who were bored and playing around the neighborhood. And, but on um, next door and all these just are the descriptions, black male driving nice car, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Group of black kids in a nice car driving around. And I, and I, and I tell my neighbors, that's me. <laughs> that's my, you know, those are, that's my son who is, you know, 15 now driving around the neighborhood with my wife. Um, so I've never had the luxury of not thinking about being black, even when it comes to work, right? I had a lady the other day, I'm a real estate guy, transactional person, and, and I'm often the only one who looks like me in any deal, quite often the only one. And this woman who was very Southern um, um, commented after we were done signing all the documents, because people still have to sign and we have unmasked and you in separate rooms. She commented on how clear, it was just amazing how clear that I spoke. And we're in the lobby. And one of my assistants was getting coffee. She kind of stopped and turned because she knows me. She stopped and turned. The lady kept going on and on. It, wow. I mean, the way that you use words and I could understand everything that you were saying and all it was going on and on and on. And um, she said everything, but you're so articulate. Oh, she missed that word. She missed because, that word. you know, that is the word. That's, right? I, I, that's, that's you know. She called you a credit. She did that in, in essence, in, in, in essence. Yeah. But and and but the way that I because I've often been the only, you know, I give I give hey thank you so much I appreciate you. I'm escorting you out, and as opposed to waving my flag and and railing it back, I just go here we go again, right? Now when I think about my uh, my younger associates who don't necessarily have the 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 total life experiences or the ability to kind of just brush things off, I'm a partner. I can. I ain't gonna see her ever again. But if I have an associate who has to constantly deal with this kind of person, right? And they're the only, and they look up and there's no diversity or anyone that they can share those experiences with or an ally or a champion or a sponsor who understands, you know, truly how to deal with those experiences, that it becomes a very lonely something. But this, this is the funny thing, but I'll shut up after this. Bianca knows I can ramble on. You're here for a reason, Clyde. I knew, hey. I knew that you were going to be great for this conversation. Stop it. So, <laughs> but then I think about my, when we talk about um, recruiting and retention, and, and I'm always thinking about diversity and inclusion within this space. When I hear the number of times, not just to just say law firms in general, how it's hard to find good, diverse talent. It's hard to, you know, where, where, where are these people? I mean, and I have to explain to folks, this is Atlanta, Georgia. We're not in Murray, you know, or Paducah, Kentucky, where I've practiced before. I've been there for de- depositions. Um, so when you talk about being intentional, all right, you have to be intentional in your efforts if you are truly interested in this diversity and inclusion and equity piece. Clyde, can I ask a question? And Robbie, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let yeah. you hop in. But mm-hmm. so for that woman, who said you were everything but articulate. Mm -hmm. Do we write her off? Oh, you want my honest answer? (laughs) I want your your honest, (laughs) because (laughs) do we just say that she's, that she's a lost cause and she'll never understand why expecting you not to be who you are is not okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, do we just say, up, oh, forget about her? When, when does she, when, and, who, and whose responsibility is it to give her that opportunity? Right. I, I will say part of me is like, eh, I won't see her again. Let her go on back to wherever she is, right? Um, and the other part of me, someone needs to have a conversation with her about it. I, I see that. Um, but Bianca, I'm tired. I am tired of trying to chase folk down and say, hey, miss, miss, hey, ooh, ooh, wait, wait. 
um, I'm okay. Um, these group of people are okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? You really should think that way. She's not, she wouldn't receive it, I would suggest, from me as well as she would receive it from someone maybe in her um, immediate circle of influence, right? Um, um, so it probably wouldn't come best from, from me. Um, but I would suggest that we probably, um, oh, we, we were talking about school. My daughter, I uh, have two kids who, one is about to be 16, one is, one is 10. And their perspective on this stuff, because they go to school with the Rainbow Coalition. They go to school with the kid with the two moms. They go to school. And my daughter, I didn't have one of the Jewish holidays off. She was mortified. What? Are you kidding me? Don't you know what it means? I'm like, girl, talk to the firm. Talk to the firm. Because their perspective, I, I have so much more faith. And, and the younger folks that are coming on, some of these more seasoned saints who I I want to just dismiss. I know you got to save them, Bianca. I don't know how, but I'm tired. I'm tired of running behind folks and saying, hey, miss, eh, you shouldn't say that. Maybe Robbie or Michael has something better. I Sure, she needs to be saved, but I don't have the energy to do it. Robbie, Michael, you want to save her? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, let me go back a step, which sure. is... I think we all have blind spots. Um, and one of the things that, I mean, one of the things that is important in in healing and making progress is in helping people acknowledge that they have blind spots and ha- helping people realize that there is a portion of the iceberg that floats below the surface, not just the stuff on top of the surface. Um, you know, that's, you hear periodically, or I hear periodically, people talk about being colorblind. I don't think I've ever heard a person of color talk about being colorblind. I mean, and, and that goes back to my point about one of the privileges of being white in America is not thinking about being white. And I, I, I still remember the first time that I was conscious of that, which was actually driving on the downtown connector, listening to a friend of mine, a coworker of mine who had been to Howard and talked about being at Howard and being in that experience of being an undergrad, his first day of walking in and realizing for the first time he was felt free to raise his hand for, and not be, have to wonder whether the teacher's reaction to him was going to be colored by the color of his skin. And that he'd spent the rest of his life up to that point you know, thinking about that. Um, and it was just this, it was one of those moments where you realize, holy blank, this is stuff I don't have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, years later, I would go to work at the city of Atlanta, um, where it was an experience, I think, unusual for many privileged white people to walk into a room in which we are not the majority of the people in the room and we are not. And, and, you know, I was working for Shirley Franklin. Uh, and so, you know, my experience was different <laughs> than a lot of people's. And so I had an opportunity for the first time in my life, in my mid-20s, to be asked, what the hell are you people thinking? And find myself in a position, and it was a friendly conversation, but it was it, it was... I had never imagined myself as a spokesman for my race. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and was, um, well, I, 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 first of all, will not speak on behalf of all white people because there are a bunch of them I don't agree with. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Maybe, maybe the midtown white people, Robbie, maybe the midtown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you can, yeah. So, I mean, I, but that was, I think actually one of the best experiences of my life and for any host of reasons, I mean, Shirley's great. It was, it was work I, I did on behalf of a city that I was born and raised in still have the opportunity to represent, believe in. I still use the, you know, the first person pronouns when referring to the city of Atlanta, we do this, we do that. But it was also great for me personally, because it was an opportunity to be conscious about being white. And what it's like to be in a room in which I was the only. Um, now, let's acknowledge real quickly and real importantly that that is different for me in Atlanta than it is for a black person somewhere else. Because I walk out of City Hall into a very different context 
than a black person walks out of, you know, an all white law firm or an all white city hall in, in elsewhere in Georgia. And I acknowledge that, but it was an opportunity for me to help see some of my blind spots. And that's brings me back to the point, which is part of how we learn when we are open to learning is by being exposed to difference because that's that reflection and that opportunity for a different perspective is how we realize, Oh, there's, there's some stuff back over here that I hadn't looked at in a while. Um, and that's one of the values of diversity is helping us acknowledge, helping us realize, uh, the, you know, what, what it is we're not looking at, what it is we're not thinking about, what it is we're taking for granted. Uh, and it's why it's important to have rooms that are not just white men, uh, because, you know, not all white men are, are the same, Lord knows, but um, there are some ways in which we're not different from each other that will prevent us or at least hinder us in acknowledging some of those blind spots. And in, in terms of representing people, in terms of, um, you know, talking about what's important in terms of making, making a difference in the world. That's interesting for me because I'm a, I'm a transactional person. Maybe you, Michael or Robbie, maybe you can speak to this for me. I apologize. I mean, to take over your thing, Bianca, but. No, please do. Go when for I it. Have, when, when I think about my, um, uh, in terms of representation, I, I do very little individual single representation. Hey, tell them wave, tell them wave. <laughs> you know, you know wave? most of my, most of my stuff. Hey, hey, hey. Sorry, Clyde. No, man. Uh, you probably don't. If I were to stand up, business at the top. That's all I'm saying, man. <laughs> Dude, it's the lawyer mullet. Hey, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've gotten to appear, I mean, speaking of being a litigator, I've now gotten to appear in federal court wearing um, gym shorts and flip-flops. Yes. Um, yes. But I look like a lawyer from the waist up, but yes. you know, Judge Brown, if you're listening, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but when you think of how do you, um, uh, when you're dealing with uh, on the litigation or civil rights kind of work that you do, I'm a transactional guy. Most of my people, if it's green, if the deal can be done, we can close it out. Let's close it out. Now, I, I have tried to do a better job uh, of making sure that we're smart with the development and, and how we do things. But do your, I, I don't know, unless I have a diverse client, none of them ever talk about diversity or the impact on their business with regards to diversity. They, they, I have had some over the years, a sale having to do, oh, I hate doing work in the city of Atlanta. That's a whole nother tag line for something else. I'd rather go up to Forsyth County. I'm like, and I know why, right? But how do, how do you how do you deal with these things with your clients? What do you how does this conversation, if it even comes up at all, what do you do with that? For the record, I get much more nervous when I go to Forsyth County than I do in the city of Atlanta. Uh, yeah. It has to do with my bumper stickers in oh. addition to everything else. But. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, I, th I think that's I think you raise a, an interesting point because I think part of being intentional, part of, you know, having those conversations. And obviously the four of us are here having this conversation, which I imagine um, there is uh, a, a fairly large segment of society that would be terrified of having this conversation and another segment of society that never wants to have this conversation. Um, and, and the reality for me as a litigator, and, 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 and the same is true as a neutral, because you, you have to think about what we ultimately do, right? I mean, we are ultimately we're presenting our cases before a cross section of society. Um, so those implicit biases, those the, the, those those reasons that someone that a juror may decide not to give my client what they should get um, is something that we talk frankly about, frank with, with my clients anyway. It's something that they are acutely aware of and that they talk about. I think there are studies that show in, in the injury context, for instance, um, the, um, the recoveries tend to be lesser for people of color um, and for women um, than for white men. Um, but, but that's a reality of litigation. Um, and and you, don't, you don't deal with it and you don't address it by, by ignoring it. 
Um, you know, on, on the one hand, you gotta, you gotta have real conversations with your clients and, and at least mine, I think, understand that. Um, the other end, I mean, for what we do anyway, is jury selection, um, hopefully deals with a lot of that, but, but you're always dealing with folks again, that, that iceberg situation who don't even, you know, don't even realize their own biases. Um, you, you know, are completely, I'm a good person. I'm not, I'm not by, I'm colorblind. Right. Um, but they, but they don't know. Um, what, you know, especially if I've got a, a client of color and they're not, or if I've got a client, if they just come from different backgrounds and, and, and they don't know what my client's been through. Um, it's hard enough for me to know what my client's been through, which, which I also say, right? I, there's not a person in this world um, who can understand exactly what you've been through, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try and do the best I can and then explain that to the other side for you. I tell people all the time in the context of, of mediations. And I, and I don't say it to be rude, but that no one's going to care about it as much as you do because no one else has lived it. And so conveying that will be your challenge. And that's, you know, that's, that's a challenge no matter who you are. But I think depending on who you are, the, the steepness of that, of that hill varies. And I, and I think that's a reality that, you know, I certainly talk about with, with folks in the context of mediation, because it's important that, you know, I, I tell people all the time, you, you need to leave with more information and you need to be considering these things. It's not me. It, it is not up to anybody to change their minds, but these are things that you sh- you should consider. And I think that good lawyers do that for their clients, right? They, 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 they let them know, all of the challenges that they may be facing within the context of, of any particular situation. And Robbie, I know that you recently uh, represented the city of Atlanta. Uh, well, the mayor and the, and the members of council, I think they were named as individuals. That's right. Um, in, in a lawsuit with the state um, regarding uh, COVID regulations. Yeah. And so we were, we were lead counsel in the, Kemp v. Bottoms litigation. Right. Um, and, sorry, go ahead. No, please. Well, I was going to ask uh, in terms of, you, you said something when we spoke a couple of weeks ago about yeah. the selection of a neutral in that, in that instance. And certainly I know that you're not going to do anything in regard to attorney client privilege, but tell us a little bit about why it was important for sort of just to, to break beyond the traditional molds in the selection of a neutral there? This is a good example, I think, of a blind spot, of, of an iceberg. Um, we, you know, the governor sues the mayor on a variety of grounds related to the city's uh, COVID response, primarily about uh, her, the mask requirement in the city of Atlanta that she had imposed. Um, you know, there were, uh, he, at, <laughs> the relief that the attorney general was requesting included things like having her not be able to have press conferences anymore, uh, talking about what she was able to do. And I, you know, I'm going to pass on commenting on some of the undertones of that, um, because the specific Here's the piece that I think is telling for Im- Im- implicit stuff is we ended up in front of uh, Judge Barwick and she asked us whether we thought mediation would be uh, useful. Ask us and ask the other side. And honestly, we said no. Um, we didn't think, <laughs> didn't think it would be useful. Um, the other, the attorney general's office said no. They didn't think it would be useful. And Judge Barwick said, "Well, I do. So you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna go mediate." Um, and she gave us 24 hours to talk about, to, to exchange names of mediators to see if we could agree with somebody. The three names we got back from the state were all old white men. Um, and as I said before, and I think what you wanted me to say again was, I have nothing against old white men. I hope to be one one day. That was it. That was the line, Robbie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our panel, the suggestions we made were not all old white men. I think there was one, one white man on it, but there were also women and there were people of color. And it was, in our view, 
And when we asked, well, what's wrong with the names we gave you? The answer we got back was, we gave you people who aren't political. You gave us political people. They gave us retired former judges. We gave them retired former judges. And I don't think they thought, my guess is that they never sat around and consciously thought those are people of color. But how that might have translated was that your choices are political. We wanted apolitical people, non-political. Well, the decision about who's political and who isn't is itself a political decision. And it was just, it was a moment where, I mean, and one of the ways in which I'm blessed is to have a client, both a city attorney and a mayor who heard that and said, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. Um, You know, I wasn't in a place, you Clyde asked, what's it like to be a litigator? Because sometimes you can imagine a situation in which you get penned between a client and and but this was a this was a situation in which my client was very clear that we were going to do what we regarded was the right thing, which was present a panel of people that we were comfortable with, and not be intimate. You know, not agree to to something we weren't going to we didn't need to agree to, uh, and so that was. I think in our dispute in particular, it was important for us to put forth a diverse panel, um, both because we thought those were folks who could best help us reach resolution, because it was people who understood that COVID is a disease that disproportionately affects people of color. Um, You know, I believe it then and believe now that if this were a disease that primarily affected old white men, we would have a far different societal response than the one we have witnessed. Um, and so, you know, experience and identity mattered to us in terms of the mediator, but it also mattered to, to, to the city attorney and to the mayor that we put people of color forward and to say, we think these people are people who are, who can help bring these parties together that, you know, they belong at a, at a dispute of this prominence. Tell me, understand, is there, is there a, a, um, a tendency, the, I love the political versus the, you know, a political, is there a, is this, is this the, the reasonable person or the, or the average person, or I'm thinking about from the neutral perspective. If you're thinking of, if you are, are they suggesting that only, and I kind of hear what you're saying, only, not necessarily old white men, but this just the white standard. Are those the only ones who can be neutral? Are those the only ones who can, who can um, truly grasp all sides and come to a, you know, let me understand that part guys. How does, cause I know from my perspective, what I hear, um, it's the, you know, in private practice, those are often the ones who, well, you know, they, they, they've worked hard, they got their credentials, you know, whatever it is, you know, and, and, and we're all prepared against that standard and that line moves still, it's still moving. It, it's still moving. Robbie said he hopes to be an old white man one day. Me too. Cause you know, I see they get it pretty good over here. Right. And so I may mean, understand that in terms of the neutral space, they can tell that a little bit more. Um, how does that what is your experience, your perspective beyond just what Robbie said? Is that what individuals think that only the, you know, the baseline or the base, you know, straight white male or older white guy, you know, is the only one who could actually adequately do this thing? What do you, what do you see? What do you experience? Explicitly or implicitly? Um, All of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, Michael, you're in a, you're in a, pers- you, you've got this perspective yeah. where sometimes because you can be a fly on the wall, right? Yeah. Be, be, because I also hope to one day be an old white man, and I happen to be Hispanic, so I so I am an, an ethnic minority. But it, but it, it you know it's interesting. I mean, we're touching on now one of the reasons, frankly, I became a neutral, and and when I did, um, because 
because I do think there is this traditional sense of what a neutral should look like or be. And, and traditionally, it's the um, retirement of old judges. And, and our older judges at this point um, tend to be old or tend, well, tend to be white, um, tend to be men. Um, and, and I think ADR was looked at in that when, when ADR, I think, first really started becoming popular, probably late 90s, early 2000s. I think that was very much the view of, OK, we're going to get this is this retired judge. He can be very fair and can you know, this is who he knows exactly what a jury might do. I think the challenge is saying, hey, that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, the, the, the ABA study found um, found a fair amount of implicit bias with judges who you know, 100% of them said absolutely not. And I think 97% of them showed um, results showing their implicit bias um, with, with people of color. So, so one, just being an, an, a retired judge does not, or, or anything, does not make you immune from that bias. Um, and then two is that ability, I think we're moving more towards neutrals who have that ability to connect with the parties for whatever reason. And is, is it that you have a common background? Is it that that neutral just has a great outgoing personality, tons of EQ, and they could connect with a lamppost? Um, but can they establish that connection? Because ultimately, in mediation anyway, the, the neutral is there to try and get both sides to voluntarily agree to do something. So what you really want is you want somebody who can connect in both rooms. I, I, I said I became a neutral now because of that. I had... Earlier on in my career, when I was still a defense lawyer, I happened to have a, a plaintiff's case where we used a med mal case where we used a um, a neutral who is very well respected within that space within central and so south Georgia. Um, and our clients happened to be Mexican and they and, and spoke Spanish. We, we had an issue with the interpreter that day, um, not because the interpreter didn't speak both languages, but she had never interpreted in a legal setting. She was from a hospital um, and she got lost in the process and she, she, she wasn't really an aid to them. And the, the mediator, a great mediator, but had to communicate a very difficult message to our clients that was true. And that message that he was trying to communicate from the other side was, they agree that they messed up. This is terrible, but you are you are a Latino family in this county that the jury tends to, or at least juries here, tend to view Latinos with some skepticism. And you're going to be speaking Spanish through an interpreter. And that can hurt the value of your case. That is a very difficult yeah, hole to thread, right? I, I mean, or, or eye to thread. That is to, to get that message across in the right way. Right? Not trying to devalue you or your case, but trying to have a conversation with you that they would understand, frankly. I'll tell you, my clients, I can talk to them and say, this is the reality of what we're going to be in front of. I mean, this is where we are. This is what our jury is going to look like. Go walk through the mall and pick 12 random people in the mall, and that is likely to be your jury. And then think about what prejudices, what biases those people may have against you and how that might affect your case. That is an important conversation to have because that's the reality of your case. But it did not, just because that person was an old white man who was respected within the medical malpractice community, that message could not resonate directly from, from him. Um, it, it, he also couldn't communicate it directly. There, there was, uh, frankly, there, there was a little bit of lack of eye contact and, and, and body language that was including them in the conversation, which I also think is common in kind of the old school view of mediation is I'm just talking to the lawyers. Well, yeah, I'm going to respect the lawyer in the room, but it, because it's, it's, it's their case and their client, but I'm going to, if in that situation, I'm going to sit in a way that makes that person feel included in this conversation because they need, because it's their case. Um, and, and so, yes, I, I think you're astute because, and, and Bianca, I think has got the, the statistics um, the vast majority of mediators and neutrals are old white males for, um, I think, a lot of reasons. I hope that that's starting to change. I think there's starting to be a younger perspective in ADR. 
um, starting to be more perspectives from people of color, starting, starting to be more perspective from women in ADR. Um, and all of those things I think are um, critically important. And, and, and frankly, just people who are willing to have these conversations, who, who are willing to look and explore their own biases and think about you know, what, what judgments they're making when they come into a room that, that may or may not be valid. Um, I give all of that and Bianca, I've overrun. I've got to go. Pick I know. Up I know. Thank I know. you all so much um, for your time. I, I, I hope that I'm going to listen in when, when this is done so I can hear the rest of the conversation. But Clyde and Robbie, thank you very much. And I enjoy talking with you. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate thank it. You, Michael. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Michael brought up a great point. Uh, th- just the idea when he, when he, when he talked about body language, it brought me back to a mediation where I was on one side of it and my mediator never actually, you know, I was the attorney on the, on the case and he never had like his body facing me because there were men in the room and they were talking about football and they thought that I didn't know anything about football what they didn't know was that my grandfather's a Hall of Fame fullback for the Cleveland Browns and broke the color barrier back in, when uh, Paul Brown was creating the team. And so I was, I've been steeped in football for all of my 40-some-odd years. And you want to talk about football? We can talk about football. But he, he made some assumptions about me. And guess what? We didn't get that case resolved because I was feeling like I wasn't included. And that... The power of being included and acknowledged and you you were saying it earlier, Clyde, that idea that all of you is being seen, acknowledged, it's it's very powerful. It it moves the needle in so many different ways. But both of you are really involved in the community in various ways. I'd love to know how you bring that level of intentionality to the organizations in which you're involved. Well, a lot of my, my, um, it's funny when I think back on, when I think about the involvement that, that I have, a lot of it is, is, is with law students of color and with organizations that work with young people, non-law students of color. And, and it's partly because, well, large part to say because of my own personal experiences. I was a, um, a, a, raised by a, a single uh, woman with two kids. And I had some amazing folk who came alongside um, to help steer me in directions that I would be in a completely different place if they had not come. And, uh, and so, you know, when my, my church folk talk about ministry, and our and the things that we do, it's all been birthed out of our own life experiences, um, and so that's why I focus, you know, a lot of my stuff on uh, organizations that deal with young people and um, deal with law students because I was that struggling law student, and I try to explain to them that I'm not that, you know, I didn't come out with the best grades. I, my firm would have never hired me, so you know. So, but my point. Clyde, can I just say that I told people all the time that ninety percent of the class is not the top ten percent. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's funny because we have uh, one of in one of our partner meetings after we had some discussions about um, um, the new classes we were hiring. This was some years ago. One of my partners got a little. He was like, "Ah, oh, this is how many of you graduated top five of your class? How many of you graduated?" And people were looking around, getting their second drink, trying to eat something, you know, uh, because the standard that we now hold young folks to is a little bit different. I, now I, we have some sumas and some magnums in my firm. I was a thank you, Lottie. You know, thank you, Lottie, that I was able to get out of school, right? Right next to you. Right. And so, but my point is, when I'm involved in those, one of the things I'm intentional with showing them are, are my points of vulnerability. When I'm dealing with law students, for example, I, I express to them how I struggled. I express to them the, the importance of, of working hard to overcome the struggle. I express to them the importance of not only getting involved in the, the um, 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 bar associations or affinity groups of folk that look like you, but get involved in the Atlanta bar, get involved in the state bar, get in, all these other things. Um, 
because I recognize the challenges that I've had, that I've been um, encountered with being often the only or having to prove that my credentials are just as good as somebody else. And I want them to come in with a level of, of, of confidence that uh, I did not have. So that's the first thing with the law students. And with the younger people, um, I want them to, to understand the beauty and the grace that they, you know, of the folks that they come from and the power that they have within their own communities. You know, we, we you know, have one of the, one, one of the, uh, uh, someone I'm close to in a working context, I'll just put it that way, but always talk about, yeah, when I, when I lived in Southwest Atlanta, whoo, yeah, we were, whoo. Uh, I'm like, so, I ask, so what's wrong with Southwest Atlanta? Oh, well, you know, you know, because this person lives up in Dunwoody, you know, <laughs> where the rest of her people are. And she was up and always would talk about, uh, boy, I mean, whoo, God, we would walk out and we'd just be like, oh, we're so glad we got out of there. And, and, I, and I have to explain to those young folks who I see at, you know, um, Mays or, or um, um, Coretta Scott King, the value that they have and how they can be the next Robbie, right? Or Bianca and, 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 and do some great stuff. Um, but the thing I think is cool though, um, is that um, think about the younger generation, we talked about this before, it's the, the level, if I can use this word, uh, to which younger people are woke, white, black, you know, LGBTQ. So it, it's nothing now for me to see a, a young white boy from Georgia State over volunteering at the school now, right? There's nothing for me to see that, uh, it, because I think they also now understand the value or the importance of building up that community. So that's, that's why I'm engaged in the things I'm engaged in. What about you, Robbie? When I was a kid and even older, my parents talked about the importance of paying civic rent. Um, and so for me, that's taken a variety of forms. One of the ones that has been most satisfying to me over the past several years is being, be, uh, being on the MARTA board. Um, and at MARTA, issues of race, issues of class, issues of privilege are never far. Um, you know, why MARTA is where it is, why MARTA is funded the way it is, why MARTA does what it does, all of those are informed by centuries of race and class and privilege uh, in our city, in our state, in our country. Um, but one of the things that's satisfying for me is if we do the job well and we do it with intention and we help we help provide opportunity for people who for any variety of reasons have been denied opportunity. Uh, we help prov lit quite literally provide mobility, access to jobs, access to school, access to um, healthcare, uh, access to the ballot box. Um, those are all good and valuable things that that can do um, and is it, and, you know, as a litigator, and particularly as a corporate litigator, some amount of what I do for a living is move money around and, and help, you know, spend years fighting about which rich person should be a little bit richer than another. Um, and so the, I, I used, before I went to law school, I cooked for a while. And one of the things I found very satisfying about cooking was the really direct and immediate sense of satisfaction and gratification of feeding somebody. There are times when litigation gives me some of that gratification. There are also times when doing the martyr work gives me that gratification because it gives me a sense that I'm not going to change the world, but on a good day, I can go home and look in the mirror and know that the guy who's looking back at me helped make my, my little corner of the world a little bit better. I suspect mayor, that it's what <laughs> called you to public service. It's and true. And what satisfies you, even after a long day of talking to people about their trash not being picked up or a pothole on their street or all of the innumerable things <laughs> that are local government, because you are making people's lives better in little ways, in ways that aren't going to make it into a dictionary or an encyclopedia someday 
or whatever the 21st century version of those <laughs> archaic <laughs> things are. Yeah. But you're making people's lives better. You're making a difference. And, you know, I, at the end of at the end of my years, whenever those come, I very much hope that I'm not going to be reflecting on a deposition I took. Oh, man. <laughs> but if I have an opportunity to think about somebody's life that I have, make better, even if it's somebody I never met, because I helped build a rail line somewhere, I helped build, you know, this, that, or the other, that'd be a good feeling. That'd be a good feeling to help to, you know, the arc of history may be long, but if I give, if I, if I take my turn giving it a tug, that's a good thing. I, I think it's what I heard from both of you. And, and when you were sort of talking about mayor life a little bit, um, first of all, I love the idea of civic rent. I, I, I want to capture it, bottle it, and put it on every wall that where I don't have something hanging in my house. It's, it's just such a not many of those for us, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great concept. And, uh, I was, I was thinking about a, um, we're doing a project here in college park and it's through a young man that I've known for gosh, ever since he was born, who is now a world champion climber. If he wanted to actually, he was considering going to the Olympics versus uh, going to college. And he's an African American man in a sport that is overwhelmingly white. And because of that, and because of his enormous aptitude and skill in this area, he's gotten a lot of sponsorships. And so he started a foundation because he wants to give back to communities and wants to put climbing walls in communities where kids don't really have a concept of the sport at all. Yeah. And he was working with a partner, uh, doing, them in boys, doing them in boys and girls clubs. And I said, well, if your foundation is going to get off the ground, how about you start in College Park? I can find you a wall. And so um, pretty soon with the turn of the calendar, I think we're going to have a climbing wall That's pretty in cool. one of our rec centers. And not only that, but he's going to be involved in getting these kids into the sport. And we're partnering with a gym uh, in Midtown that trains world champions in the sport. So if we find that next star somewhere on Godby Road, they've got this pipeline for success. And I, you know, it, it gives me chills just thinking about it because that is the little, that's the stuff that, you know, I may never see that, right? I, I, I may, who knows where I'll be in 20 years, but if there's this kid from College Park who gets a chance Man. to be beyond where he thinks she or she thinks they can be yeah. because of that connection. I mean, forget about it. Like that's like, it, that's it. Right. That, yeah, that's why it. we, that's why we do it. Um, and you wonder why I told you earlier when I, my, my daughter, we were talking about you. Um, Cause we're all about black girl magic in my house. She's 10 and she just, She's going to run the world one day and we will all work for her. I'm just, then, you know, <laughs> Olivia is her name. Right. And she, my sister who, um, you know, my kids go to school. Out, you know, Ed Woodward. My sister lives south down that way. My sister commented um, uh, about the, um, uh, the people who are from College Park and the folk are, um, I'm sorry, historic College Park. And the ones who are from Kyle Park. Kyle Park, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kyle Park. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we at my house have conversations about, well, but shouldn't we all have access to the same stuff? Shouldn't we all have it? And I told him, I said, you know, my, my friend is the mayor. Oh, my gosh. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just seeing and understanding the things that you're doing and, and the way that my young Black daughter can look up and see, right? whether it's in a dictionary somewhere or some new app is going to be developed with a list of something, it's going to now be another person embedded in her mind um, who, who looks like her, who she can identify with, who understands the importance of paying rent with this civic responsibility, right? 
uh, and who can who who she can actually reach out and touch and see is making a difference. So whereas um, you may impact that one young person who becomes that climber, imagine all the other people that you're impacting um, just because of the fact of who you are and the things that you're trying to do there. So I take my hat off too. Well, you're too kind. I I still think about those chickens though. Uh, Maybe we shouldn't talk about that here, but I still think about the chickens. They're in the back. They're, they're hanging in there. They're hanging tough. I don't think we covered that when we last spoke Robbie, but I've got some chickens in my backyard too. Um, (laughs) But I want to circle back to the MARTA conversation because the, some of the issues that you talked about in terms of diversity and equity and, and inclusion in regard to MARTA, are those things that the board is actively discussing? I mean, is there intentionality there with the people in the room? Some of us sometimes. What do you think pushes the needle to, to, to make that more of a, more of a cultural thing, right? Like the, the MARTA culture. I mean, I think there there are a couple different pieces of it. Um, there is, I think, the historic legacy of MARTA as an organization, like the city of Atlanta government, like some other governments in the state, um, in the metro region particularly, where it was perceived that people of color could get a more equal chance to succeed. Um, that it was a place where you didn't have to be white and male in order to be the CEO or to be the, to be the CFO or whatever. Um, We, the members of the MARTA board are almost all appointed by uh, the jurisdictions that have a long-term contract with MARTA that give rise to our existence. Um, so I, for instance, am appointed by the city of Atlanta. I was appointed uh, initially by Mayor Reed, um, and as were the two other city of Atlanta appointees I serve with. Um, this fall, uh, Mayor Bottoms will have an opportunity to decide if she wants to reappoint some of us. Um, other members of the MARTA board are appointed by the DeKalb County Commission. Some are appointed by uh, the Fulton, one is appointed by the Fulton County Commission, two are appointed by the North Fulton Mayors, uh, a group of people you are familiar with, Mayor. I, I am familiar with them. Um, when does the South Side get our, get our due? That is, uh, you know, uh, it used to be that the three members uh, appointed from Fulton County outside the city of Atlanta were all appointed by the Fulton County Commission until the legislature in its infinite wisdom took the two of those appointments away from the county commission where it, that it resided for decades and gave them to the North Fulton mayors. Mm, so many, so many equity inclusion thoughts there, but go ahead. Um, when Clayton County joined the system, I mean, one of the ways our members get some comfort, and I think it varies over time that we will reflect their priorities are by, you know, for, for a decade-long sales tax that they've, they've committed to that'll outlive all of us on this call, probably, um, is by being able to appoint members to our board. And so, th- I mean, that's, a, that's an equity, that's a representation, that's a participation, that's a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. MARTA is a billion-dollar organization. We spend a billion dollars a year. And so it matters that we have very aggressive uh, DBE contracting requirements or um, goals. Um, it matters that, uh, you know, it matters that we have a uh, emphasis and acknowledge in certain situations where we are, it, it matters that we acknowledge our importance and this, the, the importance of what we do in issues of social justice, um, even sometimes unintended consequences. I mean, you, there are people who talk about one of the consequences of the Beltline redevelopment has been some gentrification. Mm-hmm. Um, well, does MARTA providing transit along the Beltline accelerate that gentrification? Does it ameliorate that gentrification? Do we need to be conscious that that's at least a risk 
that we need to talk about, okay, well, we're going to do this, but why don't we also make sure these other things are in place to deal with some of the consequences from that? And the, the conversation we're having about building a light rail line down Campbellton Road. You know, there, there likely would be, there would at least be a risk of gentrification from that. Well, so let's figure that out in advance and figure out what we want to do about it and talk to our partners at the city of Atlanta and talk to our partners at, you know, invest Atlanta and elsewhere about how do we get redevelopment without triggering displacement. It is, it is a constant question. I'm in the, you know, the real estate space. And so, um, access to, to transportation. I mean, before, when I think about the way that my clients are developing things in town, you know, the old model, you know, the you know, uh, town home with two car garages or multifamily development with X number of parking spaces. Now they're trying to figure out how can I get close to a, you know, public transportation hub, right? And many of these younger in town people don't have cars at all. And, and as long as the zoning stuff requires, we don't have to have enough, we don't have to have a parking space pad per, Unit. So it's it's so interesting because when you are thinking about it from the perspective of we need transportation, we need folk to get around. Uh, when I think about myself as a young lawyer in Chicago, I could not afford a car, but I live right by the train. I was able to get to my office. I was able to get to the dry cleaners. I was able to get to the doctor. I was able to get to other places because it cost me a dollar and fifty cents to get on to get on the train and to get wherever I needed to go. Um, uh, but we moved here. We moved up to Dunwoody, and I'm thinking, I'll get on the train. Ah. Now, I have to be very mindful because Marta is a very valued and long-standing um, client of our firm. <laughs> and so we appreciate all the things that you all do. But I also recognize there's some challenges with regards to logistics and growth. Um, I live in Cobb County, and I remember uh, some years ago when, when they were trying to, my neighbors were fighting um, a bus just going down a main street, you know, away from our houses, because they were concerned with the elements it would bring in. And I tried to explain, oh, don't jump on the bus to come rob you. Because they're not going to be able to take a TV back on the bus home. <laughs> it just doesn't. But what it will do, though, it will enable some folk here in, the, in our community to get to a job downtown. Or enable some folks from some place over there to get to a job over here. And there's all kind of conversations about equity and, 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 and um, uh, uh, access with that. Yep. So when I think about development um, around town, I mean, I've worked a lot over the years with the city of Atlanta as Beltline has expanded is one of my clients. Um, um, but from the development perspective, one of the challenges I have, I don't want to be seen as the guy who's working with the big bad guy who's coming in redeveloping and kicking all the folk out. All right. So that's, 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 I can see the challenge with that. I can see we were we were just having a conversation about access uh, with uh, Fulton County, the South Fulton mayors, actually all the mayors. And uh, we had a robust conversation a couple of weeks ago before early voting started. And the mayor of Palmetto said, I noticed we don't have an early voting location. We're only slated to have voting on the day of at our library. And at the same time, we haven't had martyr service for six months. Mm. So we have this, and, and it was Palmetto and Chat Hills. So there's nothing down there for early voting. And the idea that we literally lopped off the southern half of the, or southern, probably in terms of land size, they, they encompass quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of people, not as much. But still, that connection to access, because I couldn't tell people who can't get on a bus to come up to our convention center and, and vote. And so the, the mayors got together and said, look, this is, this is a situation we've got to change. You, you've got to make it work. And so they are opening the library starting next week. But those blind spots we have, right, like that – the elections board wouldn't necessarily know what Marta is doing and how those sort of twin actions impact access right. and what, what that means for equity. It's uh, 
I don't have the answers, but I think in even, you know, I didn't, I didn't recognize the situation before uh, Mayor Bodie brought it up, but even having the conversation, we knew that it wasn't right. But I think there has to be more conversation. There has to be more awareness and more intentionality. And I think oh, that... I heard again. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It, I think it comes back to that. Mm-hmm. Communication, intentionality, and that's how we grow. That's how we learn. But I'm so grateful that we've been able to have the conversation. And it, it's been, it's always a pleasure talking with all of you. Uh, and I, I appreciate the fact that you've given up part of your Friday afternoons for it. So, uh, Kimber, I'm not good at ending things. Are you still out there? <laughs> She's probably just muted and just gone somewhere. And okay. All right. I guess if I have to record like an actual thank you, everybody kind of thing, whatever. But anyway, because I, I said it was going to be from like three to four. I'm not good at this stuff. Like I can ask questions, but like wrapping it up, I'm, I suck at that. But I, I, heck, I could have talked to all three of you like till six o'clock, but I appreciate it. Um, it was a good conversation. I hope people get something out of it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you all so much. I appreciate it. And I will say, Robbie, when your um, little person came into the room, um, this, this, this COVID way of living now is so different. I'm sometimes at home, the dog running and my, you know, kids. And it's uh-huh. just like, I used to care about going, shh, shh, I'm on a call. I'm like, man, <laughs> as long as I can get the call through, I don't even, no, and it's refreshing right. that I'm not the only one. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh no, you're not. I, it's during, so during that hearing I talked about uh, though, um, we had to stop in the middle of examining a witness because the judge's son needed help with math homework. Yeah. yeah. And so we just, awesome. we just took a 10 minute time out so that I, I, I didn't, I don't know if it was fractions or algebra or what. Oh it was, man, either way. It, it was something so great. that required. <laughs> like right then, right there. That's all. I, all day. It, it's it a is 2020. reminder that we're all human. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate that. We're all doing the best we can in 2020. I appreciate it. And we well, have to you. treat yeah. everyone with grace and just move forward that way, right? Like Great way to end it. Yep. Yeah. But anyway, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Have fun in Florida, all. Robbie and yeah. Clyde. You know, enjoy. Well, hope your back's better, one. And, yeah. and enjoy dog time. And, I appreciate it. I took some pills, so I'm a little bit better now. I'm happier since I'm sitting here. That's all I'm saying. Y'all be well. Take care, y'all. Take care. Goodbye.